Redeemed how I love to proclaim it Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed through his infinite mercy His child and forever I am Redeemed Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you for waking, waking us up this morning, oh, Father, as many did not. Oh, Father, it's been a year since this pandemic, and thank you for keeping us safe, oh, Father. Thank you for letting us to live another year, oh, Father. As, as this pandemic is going on, oh, Father, bless our people at the front who are risking their lives every day, doctors, and, oh, Father, people who are volunteering so others may live. As Elder Sukumaran breaks the word of life for our Sabbath school lesson today, oh, Father, let him not speak his words, but your words, oh, Father. As, as your son's coming is very near, oh, Father, help us to, help us to be prepared, oh, Father, be motivated in a time where we all want to just sit at home, O oh Father, wake, up, wake our hearts so we might know the full extension of what's going on today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Holy and righteous Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you are God, that you speak, you teach, and you provide us with your instructions. Help us to follow you implicitly and look up to you, who is the author and finisher of our faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Happy Sabbath to each and every one of you, all those members, the visitors, and um, well-wishers from around the world and locally here in Burtonsville, Maryland. Today is the 11th lesson, March 6th through the 12th. And so here we are on the 13th of March, studying this very strange to topic called waging love. Now, when I first saw this waging love, I said, normally we say waging war. How would it come up to be waging love? It just did not make sense to me. Then I looked up the word waging. What does waging mean? It is to stake or to pledge. To wage love is to pledge to love. Pledge to love God whom you have not seen. And how do you do that? Because you pledge to love your family, your neighbor, your wife, your children, your husband, your relatives, whom you have seen. And that's how you wage love. It's a deliberate, pursuing action to wage love, to pursue love. And this story, or this lesson title was given at the time when Isaiah was speaking to the children of Israel. And, um, and it's beautiful because it's uh, two, two major chapters, Isaiah 55, which has 13 verses, and Isaiah 58, which has 14 verses. And it's almost impossible to cover the whole lesson in, in 40 minutes. But the Lord will give us an answer as he, uh, he it is that helps us understand what we need to know for today. He gives us our daily bread. So far, memory text, we read Isaiah 58, verse 10. If you extend your soul to the hungry and to satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in darkness, and your darkness shall be as noonday. There was a story that was told in, in the lesson which, in which a Jewish cantor, a worship leader, and his wife who lived in Lincoln, Nebraska, they began receiving threatening and obscene phone calls. They discovered that the calls came from a leader of an American hate group, the Ku Klux Klan. Knowing his identity, they could have turned him into the, pol uh, into the police, but they decided on a more radical approach. You see, when they learned that he was crippled, they showed up at his door with dinner, and he was utterly flabbergasted. You see, his hatred melted away before their love. Have you ever done one of those good deeds to people who hate you? Or you just secretly hate them back? If you secretly hate them back, back you are waging war. But if you openly love them, then you are waging love. These husband, the, the, the two, husband and wife, they pursued in love. Have you ever wondered why your prayers are not answered? Have you ever wondered why your prayers have no power? You see, the condition of the soul is recorded and, ans and the answer to our lack of power is recorded in Isaiah 55 and Isaiah 58. When you get a chance today, read, please read Isaiah 55, just 13 verses, and Isaiah 58, just 14 verses. Isaiah 58, 10, uh, verse 10 says, darkness will turn as noonday. Is not this fast that I have chosen to loosen the bonds of injustice, to undo yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? Let's learn more about this important spiritual principle as depicted by prophet Isaiah. So in our Sunday's lesson, it talks about buying something free in Isaiah 55, 1 through 7. It says, come, those that thirst, come to the waters that you may have, all those that have no money, come, buy and eat. Suppose you took food and stood at the street in a big city and announced to the hungry and the homeless, you who have no money, come buy and eat. What kind of response would you get? Isaiah appeals to the people to accept forgiveness, accept it freely. And the word buy emphasis, uh, brings an emphasis that God offers people to meet their needs 
and desires. Did you know, my friend, that God offers to meet your need and your desires? All he says is come. What does it take to come? You got to believe God. You got to believe he's calling you. You got to lay down your own doubts and you got to get up and go. When Jesus told the, the person who was paralyzed, said, get up and walk, what, what did he do? His faith caught hold of Jesus' words and his action showed him that he could receive healing. How does Isaiah's approach to salvation compare to that of the New Testament? You see, we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ without blemish or spot, as recorded in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. We are not saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. God does not like us to boast about God's gift. Do you know people who boast? I have known a few that boast about any little thing that they have, oh, about a house, about a car, any little talent. I can do this or I can do that, and they just boast about things. But truly, God says, when I give you this gift of grace that you have through faith, when you believe in me, it is given to you so that you cannot boast that I have grace. No. You cannot boast that this gift is mine because of any merit that you and I have. But it is God's free gift. And there was no old covenant salvation by works to be superseded by the new covenant sal salvation by grace. You see, the covenant of grace is not a new truth. Today we hear many of the other churches talking about, oh, we are not under the law, we are under, the gra we are under grace. But it is not a new truth. It existed in the mind of God from all eternity. And this is why it is called the everlasting covenant. When God made that covenant with Adam and Eve after they sinned, that covenant was the everlasting covenant. It was fulfilled and ratified by Jesus' blood on the cross. On Monday, it talks about high thoughts and ways. Why does God say his thoughts and ways are higher than ours as the heavens are higher than the earth? What do you think it means? It means God, who is the creator, he created the universe. And all of the mysteries that our mind cannot begin to fathom, God says, my thoughts are higher. Sometimes we make plans for business. We make plans for our families. We make plans for our studies, our jobs. And all of these things, we make plans. And then we, tell, then we take our plans to God and say, God, can you please fulfill these plans? I'm bringing it to you. God never said to make a plan before you ask him. Did you ever ask God first, Lord, what is your plan for me? Did you ever ask God, who am I supposed to marry? Did you ever ask God, how am I supposed to do a business or what business should I do? Did you ever honor God in making God first and saying, Lord, I will honor the Sabbath in this business endeavor that I'm going to do. I will honor my family so that I will not work on the Sabbaths. I will honor you first. When we start to think of all these things and put God first, now our thoughts are coming up to God's thoughts. God's thoughts are always that he wants to allow us to have purity and holiness. And of all the great mysteries of the universe, no doubt the greatest one of all is the plan of salvation. A mystery we can only barely begin to understand as recorded in Ephesians 6 verses 19. E.G. White writes in the book, My Life Today, page 360, the theme of redemption is one that angels desire to look into. It will be the signs and the song of the redeemed throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. It is not worthy of careful thought and study now. The subject is inexhaustible. The st study of the incarnation of Christ, his atoning sacrifice, and the mediatorial work 
will employ the mind of diligent student as long as time shall last. And looking to heaven with its unnumbered years, he will ex exclaim, great is the mystery of godliness. Those who are trying to say, oh, I understand godliness, or I am a PhD, or I am a this, or I am a that, and so I know what it means, they will find out that they, are, uh, they don't have all the knowledge of God. And they will find out, like how God told Job, were you there when I created? Were you there when I did this and that? And Job said, no, 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 Lord, I did not. You see, he had to humble himself and realize that God was supreme. Look at the bad things that you and I, I have done. The people whom you have hurt. The unkind words you have spoken. The ways in which you have disappointed others, not to mention yourself. And yet, through Jesus, you can be forgiven of all these things and stand right now perfect and righteous in the sight of God. If that isn't a mystery, what is? To do all this wrong, unkind words, and all the things that we do against people, and still when we ask for forgiveness as in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse from all unrighteousness, and that we can stand right now perfect and righteous in the sight of God, that is a mystery. In Tuesday's lesson, fast as seen in, in Isaiah 58, 1 through 8, Isaiah talks about the fast that God approves. You see, there is a fast that man approves. He says, I fast, I give tithe, I support the church, I give offerings, I come and work in the church, I do all of these things, and I fast. I don't eat. My face is long. I am hungry. I'm sad. I'm angry that others are not fasting, but I do. You see, God has a fast that he approves. And this fast was initially spoken about at the time of the Day of Atonement, and it's the only fast that was commanded by God. In, as you read in Leviticus 16, chapter, verse 29, 31, and Leviticus 23rd chapter, verses 27 through 32. And this is confirmed by what Isaiah said in Isaiah 58, verse 3. You see, humbling and afflicting oneself referred to various forms of self-denial, including fasting. When you deny yourself, take up your cross, I mean, take up your difficulty, take up your struggles and follow Christ, God is interested in you because you're doing something that most of the world will not do. Most of the Adventists will not do. They will not humble themselves. They will not take up their difficulties and follow Christ. And you will understand more as you compare Psalms 35, 13, and Daniel 10, 2 and 3 and 12. You see, the Day of Atonement setting explains God's command to lift up your voice like a, uh, like a trumpet and the kind of ram's horn trumpet called a shofar was to be blown as a memorial or a reminder 10 days before the Day of Atonement as recorded in Leviticus 23, verse 4. Furthermore, on the 50th year, the Day of Atonement, it was to announce the beginning of the Jubilee year of the freedom. It seems that the people were expecting the Lord to congratulate them for their piety. Do you know people like that? that think that they are so pious, they're so righteous, they do so everything so right in everything that they cannot see their own mistakes. People who stop looking and stop seeing the promises of God and stop seeing the miracles of God in their life, they are the people that look at the faults of others. People, if I can be thankful to God for the things he has done in my life, for the sins that he has forgiven me, I should be the last one to look at the faults of others. And I will be the first one to congratulate another person when I see changes in them. But no, according to Isaiah 58, these are the people that congratulate themselves for their own piety. Practicing self-denial on the Day of Atonement was to express their gratitude and loyalty to him on the day 
the high priest went before God to cleanse the sanctuary and thereby cleanse them from sins for which they had already been forgiven. If I went into the house every day and I took my shoes full of dirt and walked in the house and my wife came and cleaned it, the next day I went again with dirty shoes and my wife cleaned the mud from my shoes and from the floor and I did it over and over and over again. When do you think the floors will be clean? Never. Never. Because I am treading, bringing dirt every day. And so it is with sin. As we take our sin and we bring it to God and say, oh Lord, please forgive me for this, and then go back and do the same thing, I am bringing that dirt back into heaven. You see, it is a record. Your sin is a record in heaven. And when that sin keeps coming over and over again, we keep failing on the same po points. We shout and we yell and we scream and we do all of these things. And we tell God, oh, please forgive me, I am such a sinner. And then next day or next moment, we go out and again do that to our children, to our wife, to our husbands, to our family members, to our church members, to our pastor. What happens? We find out that we do not have gratitude in our heart and we are not thankful. One of the crucial lessons that come out of these text points to the difference between being merely religious and truly being a follower of Christ. Are you a follower of Christ? Then follow Christ. In the day of atonement, when we come and confess our sins, may God grant each one of us not to repeat that sin. Because if we repeat that sin, it is as if I'm walking with dirty shoes in my house and expecting my wife to continue cleaning for the rest of her life. You see, there's a time coming when Jesus in the sanctuary is going to stand up from where he is and say it is over. Let the wicked be wicked, let the righteous, let the filthy be filthy still. Why? Because he's done. If you and I don't stop behaving that way, we'll be lost. For every sin that is unconfessed, you and I will die. For every sin that is confessed, Satan will die for it because all the sins will be taken and placed upon his head and he will die for those sins. Isaiah 58, 6 through 12, we are the acts that God considers true acts of self-denial. After all, what's harder, to skip a few meals or to use your own time and money to feed the homeless in your own town? What is the principle to be seen behind these acts? Self-denial, is it to skip a few meals? I don't think so. Anybody can skip a few meals. The hungry can skip. The people who don't have food, don't have money, will skip a few meals. Some of them, just to lose weight, will skip a few meals so that they can control their calories and intake, hoping to lose some weight. And I pray that they lose weight because these are ways to do things for yourself. But to go out and to give feed the homeless in your town, what does that say? It speaks about your heart. And your heart is what God is interested in. You see, the gospel writers focus so much more on his acts of mercy, his acts of healing, his acts of feeding, his acts of forgiveness to those in need than on his faithfulness to rituals. Do you have rituals? Do I have rituals in my life? Do we have rituals in our church that we are so caught up in the rituals that we do not show mercy? We do not pray for the healing of people. We don't really feed anybody but ourselves and our own egos, our own pride. And we truly do not forgive anybody because we do not appreciate the forgiveness of God in our own lives. See, the yearly day of atonement was a Sabbath. Today is a Sabbath. And this time of atonement, what we have to understand in our life is, God is saying, I am in the most holy place in the presence of God. I am pleading for the for, uh, confessed sins to the Father so that these sins will be blotted out forever. And the time is coming when Jesus will say no more because they are going to continue in their sins. They are not going to ask for forgiveness. They are not going to change. So how do we understand waging love or pledging love as recorded in Isaiah 55 and 58? You see, Isaiah 55, 1 through 13, it says, Seek God while he may be found. That's the first point. And I, Matthew 6, 33 says what? 
Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we want all of these things. We want glory. We want uh, all of these um, um, praises from people. But God says, no, seek me first and my kingdom, and all these things will be added. Call upon God while he is near. The opposite is true. If you don't call upon God while he's near, you will not be able to call upon him when you are far away from him. He is not, but you are, or I am. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous his thoughts. You see, there is a difference between wickedness and unrighteousness. When we think evil about others, we plan conniving evil against others. That planning and thought in our heart is unrighteousness. There is no righteousness when we plan evil things against other people. But now when we turn around and implement those unrighteous thoughts, now they become wickedness. The act is wickedness. And therefore Isaiah 55, 6 and 7 says, let the wicked forsake his way, that means his actions, his plans, and let the unrighteous forget his thoughts against others. Let this sinner return to God, and God will have mercy on him. God will abundantly pardon because God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. And as the heavens are higher, so my thoughts and my ways are higher than your ways. My word shall not return to me void is what God has promised. When God puts out his word to heal us, to forgive us, to save us, he will accomplish that which is in our lives as long as we choose to obey. As the heavens are higher, so my thoughts are higher, says God. My word shall accomplish that which I please. And God is pleased to save you, my friend. God is pleased to save me. God is pleased to save all those in the world that believe on him as recorded in uh, John 3.16. Those that believe shall not perish, but have everlasting life. My word shall prosper in the thing wherein I sent it, says God. Isaiah 58, 1 through 14 says, Cry aloud and spare not. Tell the truth. Now, I have known people who think that because the Bible says, Cry aloud and spare not, they take it to mean that they have the right to go and gossip. They have the right to accuse people. They have the right to, to make the sins of the people known to the public. You see, God set a clear example. Jesus set a clear example when the men brought uh, the woman caught in adultery. God could have easily exposed the sins of each and every one of those that had a stone in their hand. Now, they righteously did, but they were not righteous because they were publicly putting her sins out. You and I have, I have no right to publicly speak about anybody's sin. No right. Okay? I don't know how to make it more, I don't know how to emphasize it more. God said, cry aloud and spare not. Spare not means tell the truth to that person directly. Don't carry it to another person. Show my people their transgressions and sins. Show them. But don't go and say it is Mr. So-and-so or it is Mrs. So-and-so or miss this or miss that. No, no, we are not to take names. You see, Jesus, when he came and came to Simon's house and Mary was washing Jesus' feet, and he thought, think about it, he thought in his heart, if this man knew what kind of a woman this was, he would not let her, uh, let him, uh, let her touch him. And Jesus could have easily re rebuked Mary or he could have rebuked Simon but he didn't do either. He was very careful to protect the name of that sinner, Simon and Mary, both. And what did he say? Simon, I have something to tell you. One was forgiven for many sins, one was forgiven for less sins. Which one loved more? And Simon judged correctly and said, the one that loved more. And then Jesus told him, I came into your house, you did not wash my feet, you didn't give me a kiss, but look at this lady. She has not stopped kissing my feet from the time she came, and she's wiping my feet with the tears of thankfulness and joy for the forgiveness of her sins. You see, cry aloud and spare not does not give you or me the right to gossip about anybody, to argue, 
to accuse or to, in, uh, to speak about somebody in your anger. All of this is an extension of our pride because where the pride lifts ourselves, we think we are that great that we have the right to do so. But God said, no, don't do that. God said, seek me daily and delight to know my ways. Take delight in approaching to God. And do not challenge God to look at the methods of fasting. See, in those days, when somebody fasted, they thought, God better take notice, I'm fasting. Do not afflict your souls to, uh, for God to notice you. In other words, just like sometimes, you know, when uh, somebody made a comment to me one time, and uh, people were going for a prayer, and they say, oh, oh, come, come to the prayer, because they're going to be having food after the prayer. And another person commented, oh, you guys are fasting and feasting? I said, wow, <laughs> I didn't think about it like that. But when I heard it, I was like, whoa, that's, that's something. Are we going there for the fasting and prayer so that we can feast after that? I'm going to leave that alone. But that's what somebody said. You see, we need to take delight in approaching to God. And do not challenge God to look at the methods of our fasting. Do not afflict your souls for God to notice you. Do not afflict your souls for God to take knowledge of your fast. God says, you find pleasure doing your fast. You exact all your labors. That hit me hard. In other words, you, are you a type of person that wants to give a job and don't want to pay somebody right? You're exacting labors from them. You promise to pay them three days of labor and, or five days of labor or one month of labor, and then you choose not to pay them. God says, I will not answer your prayers. That is not the kind of fast that I'm looking for. God says, you fast for strife and debate. That is not the fast that I've chosen. You don't fast because you can say, we went for fasting and prayer. What does that make you, righteous or unrighteous? Are you trying to debate your holiness in front of other people? You see, this is what God had chosen, to loosen the bands of wickedness. What is this wickedness? Now, I had to think about it. It's an absolute action because we, we understood earlier, unrighteousness is when you think about it. But wickedness is when you plan it and actually put it on somebody else. So you and I that put burdens on others is an act of wickedness. But God says, no, loosen the burdens of wickedness that you have put on others, that I have put on others, that the church or anybody has put on others. When they put burdens on others, put rules and regulations on others, it's an act of wickedness. We make heavy burdens for people, but God says, let the oppressed go free. That's the kind of fast I want. You oppress somebody? Okay, stop oppressing. That is a fast, because you are denying yourself the pleasure of acting on behalf of Satan to oppress another person. And then the next part of the fast that God likes is to break every yoke. What does that yoke mean? I mean, where we came from, when we were growing up, we used to do plowing in the field. We'd take two, two bull, bulls and then we'd put a yoke on them and we'd walk with the plow behind it to make the furrows. You see, we put the yoke on the, on the oxen, as it were. You and I actually put yokes on people the way you treat them, the way you mistreat them, the way you talk to them, the way you speak to your husband, your wife, your children, to your church members, the way you speak to your pastors. Are you speaking in anger? You're putting a yoke on them. They never ask for your burden, but you put it on them. I put it on them. And truly, that is not the fast God was asking for. He said, break that kind of yoke, which is really Heavy burden, it's an oppression, it is an absolute act of wickedness. Then God says, the other parts of the fast that I like is to bring the poor to your house, to cover the naked, and your light shall break forth as the morning. You see, this is how you get your prayers answered. And your health spring forth speedily. Wow, strong words. Health shall spring forth speedily as we stop to oppress and put bands of wickedness on other people close to us. You see, I cannot put a yoke on somebody who is not next to me. You have to be close to them to put a yoke. I cannot oppress somebody who is far away. Yes, I can verbally abuse, abuse them, 
but that yoke, the actual bondage, bondage normally comes when God says they put it on people and we do not want them to go free. We want to oppress them, oppress them, oppress them, and call, sometimes we even call it love. But God said you are supposed to wage love, fight for love, not fight against love. And as we put oppression and burdens on other people, we are waging war. We are not waging love. God says, when you have that right kind of um, fast, your righteousness shall go before you. Do other people see you as righteous or they see you as a wicked person? If more than one person sees you as a wicked person, you may be wicked. We have to rethink our actions, rethink our thoughts, rethink our behavior, and come humbling ourselves to God. God says, I will be your reward. And when you call, I will answer. You see this, my wife and I, we, in our family, we use this acronym G-A-A-S-P, GASP. Stop putting forth your finger, your pointing finger. That's another point that is spoken here in Isaiah 58. Stop putting forth your pointing finger by gossip. Stop putting forth your pointing finger by accusation. Stop putting forth your pointing finger by your anger. Stop putting forth your pointing finger by your slander. And stop putting forth your pointing finger by your pride. G-A-A-S-P. Gossip, accusation, anger, slander, pride. Isaiah 58 deals with three main themes. Self-denial, social kindness, and the Sabbath. Look at these other ties between the themes of self-denial and social kindness and the Sabbath as depicted in Isaiah 58. Sabbath freedom from weekly toil is kind to people because it lets them be refreshed. My friends, do you allow another person to be refreshed or do you want them to be in bondage under you, under your rule, under your unrealistic behavior, under my unrealistic behavior, do I want people to be under a rule? God says, no, don't do that. We see self-denial and social kindness and Sabbath were important on the day of, of atonement. And, Isaiah, and in Isaiah's day, they are just as important in the end time day of atonement. When we understand where we are in, the, in, the, in time, and we look at God who has given us so much mercy, he wants us to truly be with Christ. He wants us to be in heaven. God has no desire in the death of the wicked. When Jesus was on the cross, and he came, before he went on the cross, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, if you can't take this cup from me, this was the burden of separation from God that he was experiencing. And it was so devastating to him that blood came from his skin and came down as drops of blood. On the cross, you see, Jesus came and he died. But it was a voluntary death. They could not kill him. He came as a human being, but they could not kill him. They put him on the cross. And yet, he had so much compassion in spite of the great amount of pain that he was put through for my sin, for your sins, that he said to the, uh, even then he said to the man who said, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said, I promise you that you will be with me in paradise. Jesus, when he was done, when Satan tried his best to make Jesus to fall, even for one moment he couldn't get him to do so, what happened was, as it was in the, in the beginning, at the time of creation, Adam and Eve fell because they fell to appetite. They fell to appetite. Jesus would not even take and taste of that vinegar. And they fell because they did not they wanted to worship their own ideas, and their own behavior, and they thought that was righteous. Jesus came to fulfill all that. And when he was done, he said, it is finished. And he put his head down, and he died. You see, God says, do not continue in that sinful manner. Because as we continue in that sinful manner, all we are doing is crucifying Christ afresh. 
every time you and I sin, every time we gossip about somebody, every time we get angry at somebody, every time we don't check our own pride and we look at somebody else as if they are more sinful than us. We are always to consider another greater than ourselves. Isaiah 55 and 58, the prophet Isaiah appeals to his people to give up their thoughts and ways and to return to God. My friend, please give up your thoughts, give up your ways and return to God, whose ideal for their happiness is so much higher than their own. God's ideal for you is much higher than anything that you can think about yourself. He mercifully pardons and then he insists that the pardon be merciful. Are you merciful? Am I merciful? If I am not merciful, it is a clear evidence that I may not be pardoned. But if I am pardoned, I will show mercy. I will be in harmony with the spirit of the Day of Atonement. We are living in this Day of Atonement since 1844, until the probation closes. And we are to remember this time, from 1844 to the end of time, should be remembered as a Sabbath. I know we work secular jobs, but we are to remember God in our lives at every moment. Seven days a week, we are to be Adventists. Seven days a week, not only on the seventh day and six days you dedicate to the devil. And because of the gift of God's forgiveness, if it is truly received, it will transform the heart. On the authority of God's word, I can say to you that all of these things that we choose to do for God will transform your heart. The title of today's lesson study is Waging Love. I've never heard waging put together with love, but waging war. And that is what the devil wants us to do. But God says, no, stake, make a pledge that you will pursue love. You will wage love to bring honor and glory to your Father, which is in heaven. And he will reward you openly. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.